Lord. Uh, as, we're, as we're worshiping, so my name is Ben Geetson, which you've been told that uh, I am a worship pastor up in Watertown, South Dakota, which I know there's some Watertown peeps uh, in the building. It's exciting, exciting to see you guys. Yeah, Watertown. Arrows. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm a worship pastor, and I gave my life to Jesus when I was 19 years old at a college ministry called Oasis. And it was in the activity center. <laughs> and it was in 2006. And it was one of the most profound experiences, obviously, that I've ever had in my life. Because it was the night that my life changed forever. And so I want to give you just an opportunity tonight, one, to be encouraged. I love, Pastor Steve, what you said about tonight is not an opportunity for me to come and try out. It's an opportunity for, um, for us to come and give before the Father and be encouraged from the Word of God. In Mark 1, Jesus comes, and before he, as he's doing his ministry, he says, The time has come. It's right now. The kingdom of God is at hand. So repent and believe the good news. That word for time there is not a chronological, or a, a, a chronological word. It's not, it's, it's not a word for the time of what we think, oh, this is what the clock says. The word there is kairos, and it means right now God is doing something. It means right now God wants to speak to you. Is right now God wants to get a hold of your heart and let you know what he thinks about you. He wants to get a hold of your heart and express to you the love that he has for you. The time is now. It's not giving my life to Jesus and then coming to church and then when I die, I get to experience the Father in heaven. It's the kingdom of God is at hand. God wants to bring the kingdom of God into your life right now. And so I'm just going to share some stories. I'm going to share some verses. I'm going to share some experiences that me and my wife have had that we've experienced over the last couple years that have changed our life and how we experience not only faith and how we experience relationship with the Father and, and how we experience relationship with each other and how we experience a relationship with the world, but how we've experienced rest for our souls, how we have experienced the fullness of joy that comes from being in the Father's presence and knowing him. See, Jesus came, one, to show us the character of God, to really help us understand and know this is who God is. Two, he came, he lived a perfect life, he died on the cross, was raised three days later, that we would have relationship with God be restored and redeemed. And everyone now who says yes to Jesus is trying to figure out what does it mean now to live life as a Christian, as a follower of Christ. This is for people who have just given their life to Jesus. This is for people who have been in the church. So like me, came to know Jesus at 19, didn't really come to church ever. I still need to say yes to Jesus and say, okay, how am I supposed to live this life now? Or persons like my wife who came running out of the womb, holding a Bible and singing hymns and songs of praise. We all are trying to imitate the life of Jesus. As we step into church, to have just the heart and the humility to say, God, I believe, one, that you're going to speak to me tonight. I believe that you want to do a work in my life to help me get one step closer to you, Jesus. And I actually, and, and, and I'm, I'm believing this to be true tonight, that there's people in here potentially who have not made that step just to give their life to Jesus. And I'm excited for the end of the night to give you an opportunity to do that. So like I said, my name is Ben. I'm a worship pastor. I gave my life to Jesus in 2006. Uh, and I tried to figure out, I had to learn quickly, or wanted to learn quickly because of how I had experienced life, what it meant to be a follower of Christ. And so as I'm reading scripture and in Bible studies and following people who have followed Jesus longer than I have, I started noticing and recognizing that Jesus had these certain rhythms in his life that he did. And so in Matthew 11, super uh, famous scripture passage that, that he says, says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and he says, and learn from me. For I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I don't know if you know who Eugene Peterson is, but he says it this way. He says, come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it. And come learn the unforced rhythms of grace. 
That's what trying to imitate Jesus. We're trying to learn the rhythms of grace that Jesus had in his life. And as I search the Gospels and as we search the Scriptures and as we see how Jesus lived and watch him and how he worked, we can see three specific rhythms and three even specific relationships, I would say, that he had. And we're going to find that in Luke 6, and I think we got the Scripture up there. Um, Yes, beautiful. This is Luke 6, verse 12. It says this. I'm going to read it from the screen. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray, and he spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. Simon, he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. He went down with them and stood on a level place, and a large crowd gathered. Yes, this is why you read from your Bible. Perfect. Just kidding. And a large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to, he- to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming out from him and healing them all. See, I believe and I've seen through Scripture and something that me and my wife have experienced is that there are three specific rhythms of grace that Jesus had in his life. Three specific rhythms and relationships that Jesus intentionally and willingly pursued. And one of those is obviously his relationship with the Father. It said, in one night, one of those days, Jesus went out and he prayed. Prayer was something normal for Jesus. Prayer was like breathing. It was as essential to him as being able to have air in his lungs so that he could survive and can continue. Jesus modeled the unforced rhythm of encountering grace. He purposely sought out opportunity and time to grow in his relationship with the Father. And for him, it wasn't unforced, meaning he was willing, he was intentional, it was purposeful. Jesus got into these moments where he received joy and peace and identity from the Father. He encountered grace and it was intentional. When I was a young kid, we went to church like twice a year. Do you guys know which days we went to church? We were Christers. We went Christmas and Easter. It was just classic tradition stuff. Faith was not a big part uh, of my family and, and a relationship with God was not something that we could ever even talk about because it wasn't important. We were apathetic to the idea that God could actually be a part of our life and desired to meet with us and desired to help us and desired to be in relationship with us. Like he says he wants us. He wants us to know him. That wasn't something we did in my home. It wasn't normal for us to talk about God at the dinner table or talk about Jesus. It wasn't normal for us to even go to church. We watched a lot of football. We had a lot of fights. We had rhythms in our life that were unhealthy and things in our life that pushed us actually into destruction. So both of my parents are alcoholics. They both, from as long as I could remember, drank every day. And I remember thinking even when I was in elementary school, as a young little kid, thinking, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be the one who has to come home, who doesn't have a purpose for his life or is not secure. I don't want to be a one who has to come home and drink and pass out and just live the next day. That rhythm to me seemed unhealthy and boring. I saw the destruction that my parents were living in. And yet at 12 years old, I used to go golfing with my dad a lot. At 12 years old, he handed me my first beer because I just it became then something normal. And I thought in my head, well, this is something that all fathers and sons experience. And so at 12 year old, I I have my first beer and I'm drinking a little more with my dad. And all of a sudden at 14, I'm stealing liquor from their cabinet and drinking every day as soon as I got into high school. And for me, it was a normal rhythm to go to school, go to work or whatever activity I was in, go home, make sure my parents were taken care of or passed out in whatever room or bed they needed to be passed out in. And then I would start drinking from midnight to three or four in the morning. And it was a way for me to forget about life. I hadn't had experiences of encountering God's grace in my life. 
And so this happened through high school and then all of a sudden I get to college and I think, okay, it'll be better. Life's gonna be better, right? I'm out of that environment. I'm on my own, I'm more independent. I'll be able just to kind of make my own decision and feel like I don't have any cares or worries and life got harder. <laughs> because the cares and worries that I thought were really bad got magnified because all of a sudden I was making decisions even more so on my own. I was becoming more independent. And so I didn't have opportunity to encounter God's grace. I didn't think it would have been important for me. Didn't want to pursue it. Didn't want it to be an unforced rhythm in my life. But I got into the dorms and I lived in uh, Pearson Hall, second floor. Uh, I can't remember the room number. But across the hall, there was these two kids named Levi and Morgan. And we got to know each other. And in, in, in my pre-Jesus days, I listened to a lot of Dane Cook, who's a comedian who I do not recommend because um, he's super inappropriate. But I was listening to him, and I had blasted, and I was drinking Mountain Dew, because why not? And I was playing Madden 05, because Ray Lewis was on the cover. Yes, I'm that old. And they saw me playing Madden, and they came in, and they're just like, hey, what are you doing? Oh, we like football. Yay, Vikings. Go Vikes. Vikes fans in the house? No? Yes. We'll, we'll suffer together in their never-ending quest to try to win a Super Bowl. And so we just connected, and they became my friends. And they pursued relationship with me. And then all of a sudden, I started to learn that they love Jesus. Uh, the very first weekend, actually, we, we, as we were at college, they said they're going to Life Light, which was a Christian uh, conference, a uh, worship conference on, in Sioux Falls area. I was like, I don't know what Life Light is. So I asked them. They said, oh, it's a big worship conference. We'll go sing songs. And I said, that sounds terrible because I don't want anything to do with Jesus. I didn't think God would help me in my life. And so they invited me. I said, no, thanks. And then all of a sudden, as our relationship kept going, they kept inviting me to church. But as they were inviting me to church, they were actually becoming friends with me. They were showing me love and relationship that I had never experienced before. And so one week happened uh, where I was, it was just a struggle. I get a call from my dad. Mom's going to rehab again. Sister's moving out of the house, all this different stuff. And I remember thinking in my head and feeling, okay, I really want to go drink right now so I can forget about what's going on. But something inside me finally said, this hasn't been working. You've been doing this for how many years and it's never helped? So I sat on the futon because you have to have a futon if you're in the dorm. And I'm sitting there like, just like, what am I supposed to do? And Levi and Morgan is on a Sunday. They knock on the door. I open the door and they say, hey, Ben, we're going to church. They ask the question. And then all of a sudden I'm walking into the activity center doors. I don't remember saying yes. I don't think, I don't think they drugged me. They may have beat me over the head with the bat. But there's a space in my life where I was like, I don't remember how this happened, where I got to church somehow. And I walked into the church and I heard an incredible testimony and that's where I first encountered God's grace. Where I started hearing about the Father's love for me that I've never heard before. And it just started clicking in my head. And in that moment and in those moments, that first night at Oasis, this guy said, who's given his testimony, he said, Jesus wants to invite you into his life to help you with burden and worry and chaos. And he didn't promise a better life because I think we put expectation on what a better life should look like with Jesus when that's not necessarily true. But he promises to be with us no matter what. And I knew in that moment I needed Jesus. And ever since then, I've been trying to find, be intentional and willing to encounter God's grace. And so coming to corporate gatherings where we can come on Sunday night and Sunday morning and just worship God, we're encountering God's grace. When we're going and praying and reading his word, we're encountering God's grace because he desires to speak to us. He desires to speak life to us. The second rhythm that Jesus modeled is his rhythm of growing in grace. And he showed us how to grow in grace. Now growing in grace uh, is this idea of us becoming more like Jesus. He's perfecting us to be the person that he's ultimately created us to be, which is awesome. And as we live this life trying to follow Jesus and imitate his life and watch him and, and learn from him, we start becoming more like him. We start surrendering things in our life that we know are not good for us that are unhealthy. I love the prayer time at Oasis because it's an opportunity to, to, to surrender garbage and junk and allow God to fill with peace and joy and life and love. He gives us the opportunities to grow in grace. And for us and for me, I found this best to be in community. 
Out of 70 people that, that Jesus had that were his disciples, he picked 12. We saw that in the scripture in Luke. If you don't know this, from that 12, he had an intimate three that he kind of brought with him on different times, and that was Peter, James, and John. And he brought them with him in times when he would go up to the mountainside to pray, and there's a story in the Bible called the Transfiguration, which is really cool, um, but he brought them with him, and they experienced the glory of God in a way that not, none of the other disciples did. It, it was such an amazing experience that he actually told them on the way down that, hey, don't tell anyone else about this, because they're not ready for it. He brought them, uh, those three with them, as, as, as he was going to minister and to serve and to heal. And ultimately, Jesus had these three, and he brought them in one of the most difficult times of his life. As he's getting ready to die for all of humanity's sin, he brings them with and has them sit down with him as he goes and prays in the Garden of Gethsemane. We grow in grace with each other. With each other, we can help each other, one another become more like Jesus. And so I give my life to Jesus, and from then on, I was like figuring out, okay, what am I supposed to do? Like, I'm going to every Bible study I can hear about. I'm going to every worship service I can hear about. I'm going to Crew uh, and Navs and Oasis, and I'm trying to go to Sunday morning church. And I'm recognizing that I have these people in my life, Levi and Morgan, who are speaking life into me, who are encouraging me, who are helping me become more like Jesus and to grow in grace. It was important for Jesus to have people in his life to bring with him in the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. Le Levi and Morgan, for me, were the people I could tell anything to. When I couldn't handle my mom drinking anymore, when I couldn't handle my dad being verbally abusive to my family, they were the two I could go and talk to, and they would pray for me. See, we help each other and we push each other to help become more like Jesus. And there's so much more about growing in grace that we could go into. There's the ideas of when we serve, we become more like Jesus in growing in grace. When we get baptized, Jesus was baptized for us that we would know, hey, this is important, I want you to do this. At Jesus' baptism, the heavens opened up, the Holy Spirit came down descending like a dove, and his father said, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. When we're baptized, it's a public confession of us saying, I'm in the family of God. I'm now one of you. Let us grow in grace together. And this last rhythm that we see in Luke 6 uh, that Jesus pressed into was this rhythm of giving grace. He showed us and modeled for us what it looked like to give grace. A large crowd of disciples was there as he came down from the mountain as he picked his, the 12 and then a great number of people from all over Judea, Jerusalem, and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. As Jesus lived on his earth, the vision of the Father had given him never passed his mind. He knew he came to bring the kingdom of God to people who needed it, which is everyone to people who were broken and poor in spirit and who were struggling with life. He came to bring the kingdom of God and he gave grace well. And what's incredible about following Jesus and being a Christian is that you don't have to be perfectly like Jesus in order to give grace away. A couple months after I'd given my life to Christ, my sister gives me a call and she just had a friend uh, who had committed suicide and she's down in Sioux Falls, I'm in Brookings. And so I drive down and I meet with her and she's on the bathroom floor of our mom's house. My mom lived in Sioux Falls in an apartment. And I'm sitting there with her and I'm, I'm just there and she's bawling and she's depressed. And I'm trying to figure out, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Like, I don't, what am I supposed to say in this situation? And she looks at me and she says, Ben, I just want to have what you have. She said, I've seen what has happened in your life over the last couple months, and something's different. And it wasn't me. It was Jesus. And this was in a moment of me trying to follow Jesus, of me still struggling with my addiction, of being angry at the world, and sometimes even angry at God with what had happened and what was going on in my life. But he gave me an opportunity to give grace, because he doesn't force us or call us to be perfect in order to help others get one next up closer to Jesus. So I was able in that moment to pray with my sister and she gave her life to Jesus. Jesus modeled these three rhythms incredibly well. 
And as he lived out these unforced rhythms of grace, of encountering God's grace, of growing in grace, and of giving grace, it was not only a balanced life that helped him understand how he's supposed to approach and live life, but it gave rest for his souls. And I've noticed that when one of these rhythms is out of my life for a season, I'm out of balance. I've noticed that when I'm not fully connecting with the Father and I'm not intentionally pursuing and being willing at just encountering God's grace, whether that's just simple as being faithful to coming every week to church or oasis. Maybe that's as simple as just just praying for a moment every day. I know that, that when that's not in my life, my life is out of balance and I don't have rest. And I just want to say something real quick, and I, and I wish I would have mentioned it before, but with encountering God's grace, here's what I've learned. So I'm a worship pastor. I, I love worship. Worship through music with the body, with people, with sons and daughters, the multitude, is one of my favorite, ex- favorite experiences ever. But I've noticed that profoundness for me And I think profoundness for us in trying to follow Jesus doesn't come in the deep theological sayings of something new from the Word of God. Those are really cool. To be able to come to church and hear something different and new and something I've never heard before. But when I started to have expectations of me having to hear a specific thing or hearing a specific song or listening to a specific person sing, when those expectations weren't met, I wasn't having rest in my soul. And so I had to learn the unforced rhythm of encountering God's grace without expectation. And all of a sudden, when I stopped having expectation, I started to find true rest and abundant life and fullness of joy. When I pursued willingly and intentionally growing in God's grace, trying to become more like a son, and I struggle still. (laughs) Yes, my wife, she's right over there. When I haven't had expectation on these things, there's been just more rest and joy in my soul. When I've gone out to try to share the gospel with people or serve in some capacity, when I've done it without expectation, there's been more rest for my soul, more joy in my heart, because then I'm not disappointed. Because it's not my job to change someone's life and soul. It's not my job to save people. It's our job just to be faithful to what God's asking us to do. So as we encounter God's grace, as we pursue growing in grace, and as we pursue being grace givers, there's a promise that Jesus says you will find rest for your soul. And so I'm going to have the worship team come up. And they're going to lead us, obviously, play some music and have a time of prayer, and there will be people praying in the back. I believe without a doubt that every time we come into a place like this, every time we intentionally pursue and are willing to encounter God's grace, there's a next step for us. Because Jesus does not invite us into relationship to leave us where we're at. He's always pushing us to help us become more like him. And so maybe as I've been talking, as I've been speaking, as we're reading scripture, as I've been telling story, maybe something hit in your heart. Maybe something connected with you in some way, shape, or form. For me, I believe that that's God speaking to you. So as you take this time to just be before the Father, as you take this time to pray, ask God, what's that one specific thing? What's that one specific thing that you want me to just grow in? Maybe it's encountering God's grace. Maybe God, you're asking me just to be a little more intentional and willing because I'm just not doing it. Maybe it's, I'm so isolated. I feel like I'm by myself in, in, in this journey of trying to follow Jesus and become like him, maybe he's asking you to invite people into your life, to encourage you, to pray with you, to be with you. Maybe it's, he's asking you to give a little grace to the person that's sitting next to you in your class that you've been speaking with all semester, all year. Or that person that you see every week at lunch, sitting at the same table. Maybe it's a family member who you know is struggling that you just need to pray for and just reach out to. 
maybe it's just someone that needs to be asked, how's your, how's your life going? But God gives us these opportunity every single day, every single week. And so as we pray, ask God to speak to you. What's that one thing, Father? Where are you asking me to move into? And for those of you who are here tonight that you've never personally pushed into giving your life to Jesus, here's what this looks like. You need to know that God created you to be in relationship with you. And because of sin, a relationship that was one, once perfect with Adam and Eve was separated. And sin entered the world and caused chaos and darkness. And here's simply what sin is. Sin is just living for ourselves. And so Jesus was sent down. He lived the perfect life to die on a cross, was raised three days later. And it says all of those who confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, will be saved. They will have eternal life. So to repent or to turn from sin and run towards Jesus and to believe is just simply saying, I recognize that I've been living for myself. God, I want to stop living for myself. And Jesus, I want to start living for you. I give you my heart. To believe is not just to trust, but to be in full alignment with. So for those of you who feel like, I need to take that step. I'm going to challenge the people. There'll be prayer, prayers in the back. Go and tell them, I want to give my life to Jesus tonight. For those of you who have that desire or that inkling that I need to grow in grace. It's not too late in the semester to start meeting with groups of people to try, try and encourage each other and, and help each other know Jesus a little better. For those of you who have a person who's been laid on your heart that just needs to be encouraged, that just needs to be pointed to Jesus, believe without a doubt that you've been anointed by the God of the universe, by the King of creation, anointed to go and be his ambassador, anointed and filled with power of the Holy Spirit to go and encourage someone and help people know Jesus whether that's sharing the gospel, simply praying for them, or simply serving them. You don't have to be perfect to help someone else encounter God and encounter God's grace and encounter Jesus. You don't have to be perfect to give grace. Just be willing. So let me pray for you. As you pray, just allow God to speak to you, to give you that next step. Father, we thank you that you give opportunity in the midst of sometimes chaos. Father, I thank you that you have gathered your people here to encounter your presence and your grace and your love. That you have gathered us here to help grow and become more like you, Jesus. That you've gathered us here so that you could send us out to go be light to the world, light in the darkness, love in a world full of hate to bring freedom where there are shackles. God, just open our ears just now to be able to receive from you. How are you asking me to move? What are you asking me to pursue? Thank you that as we live these rhythms of grace and as we're intentional, you give rest to our souls. So for those who are burdened, who are worn out, who are tired, give them rest, King Jesus. Help them encounter you heavily right now, King Jesus. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your invitation to know you, to love you, to be with you. Pray all these things in your name.